tension running high in northern Lebanon after deadly clashes between supporters and opponents of Bashar al-Assad, raising fresh concerns that the unrest in Syria is spilling over into its neighbor. Just how serious are these concerns and what does that mean for an already volatile region? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Lebanon is now feeling the impact of escalating violence over the border in Syria. At least three people were killed and dozens injured after skirmishes turned violent in the northern Lebanese city of Tripoli on Saturday. Tensions brewing between a pro-Assad Alawite community and an anti-Assad Sunni neighborhood spiraled out of control, leading to two days of violence. This, as activists say, hundreds of civilians were killed in the newest escalation of violence by Syrian government troops in the city of Homs. A bomb attack in Aleppo also killed 28 people. No one has yet claimed responsibility for it. It comes as the international community considers a new Saudi resolution to pressure the Syrian government following a double veto of a UN draft calling for action last week. Our correspondent Sue Turton was in the Lebanese city of Tripoli and sent us this report. The military set a deadline of a ceasefire for the two communities, the anti-government Syrian government regime on this side and the pro-government regime just about 100 metres along from this street over there. But we're still hearing gunfire and explosions since that deadline has passed so that it looks like it's not having any effect. And just to give you an idea of how close this gunfire these grenades have got, at six o'clock this morning, two RPGs went through the wall of that flat on the second floor, where I'm told by the family that 10 children were sleeping. Mostly, they are all absolutely fine. You can see by the huddle of people here on this side of the street that they have to hide behind buildings that can't be seen by the snipers. If you go across to the other side of the street, I'm told that the snipers from up behind us can possibly see us and there is a risk that you might be hit by a sniper's bullet and even to get here we had to run through alleyways and streets further out of the residential housing estate we were told that if we didn't run we could well be hit by a sniper's bullet people here are hoping that the those that are firing their weapons may well listen to local leaders who are saying please put down your weapons and let's start talking so, is the unrest in Syria spilling over into Lebanon? For more on this, we're joined by our guests in Lebanon, in Beirut, Kamal Wazni, a political analyst. Also in Beirut, Elias Hanna, a military and political analyst. And in Tripoli, Mustafa Alouche, a member of the Future Movement. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Mustafa Alouche, we'll start with you uh, first. How would you describe the mood in Tripoli today? This uh, has been a tradition in Tripoli over the last... Uh, some uh, seven years and uh, probably it started before in 1976 in the beginning of the Syrian occupation of, the, uh, of Lebanon. And uh, it happened that uh, the Syrian regime has used part of the uh, uh, Tripolitan uh, population, which is more, uh, uh, partly Alawi, and uh, they used them as uh, 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 supporters and uh, defender of the Syrian regime against the vast majority of the of the uh, city. And uh, over the last seven years, we had uh, several uh, incidents uh, between uh, the, the, these two components. And uh, lately, uh, the last two days, we had very limited, uh, in fact, the clashes. Uh, they are not similar to what we have seen before. But it means that the tension is still there, and uh, uh, the, the, the usual way the Syrian regime has uh, used over the last uh, several years is still present and a potential threat for the lives and the security of the uh, people in Tripoli. If the tension is still there, is there a danger, do you think, that there could be further violence? Can the Lebanese army keep a lid on it? Well, the Lebanese army can limit or uh, control partly uh, or at least 90 percent uh, the, the possibility of uh, uh, clashes uh, that um, may recur. However, uh, if there is a real decision from the intelligence, uh, Syrian intelligence specifically, to uh, open fire completely, I think it will be impossible even for the Lebanese army unless it uses uh, a lot of force and a lot of open fire to stop the clashes. So yes, we are in uh, a continuous 
uh, uh, and probably imminent danger of having uh, the clashes again at any time. Uh, Elias Hanna in uh, Beirut, we heard a little there from Mustafa about what perhaps lay behind the weekend's violence. Why Tripoli? Tell us in, in your words uh, about the, the socio-political makeup of, of the population there that made it particularly ripe for violence. I think there is many levels to study or analyze the situation in Tripoli. If you go to the social political issues, for instance, you have two sides, rural, when you have high rate of birth, when you have a high rate of unemployment, and you have political affiliation. Uh, yesterday, uh, Rifat Ali Deeb uh, said it so clearly that he is affiliated to the regime in Syria, to President Assad, he is affiliated to Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, and then to Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, as well as to the axis of resistance. However, in this particular uh, political affiliation, if you take it into consideration, the line dividing uh, the Sunni line, where you have Salafi, and when you have, you know, the Alawi from the other side, keeping in mind the historical events and problems that have occurred since, you know, 1976 and especially in 1983. So within this perspective, this is like an indicator. This is like, you know, uh, a consequence for what's going on in Syria. Why? Because I think that the Alawi extension, the Alawi demographic extension in Lebanon goes from the you know, uh, southern of Syria or northern of Lebanon into Akka, which is, you know, a middle area between Tripoli and uh, Syria, and as well as uh, to Tripoli. Within this perspective, I think everything is related to everything. And uh, why not else uh, outside Tripoli? Because this Tripoli has a particular constituencies that is totally related to what is going on in Hamas and uh, Idlib and Syria overall. Kamal Wasnia, I want to, to just pick up on, on something that, uh, that Mustafa was saying a few moments ago when he said that uh, the, the Syrian regime could have been behind uh, what happened in Tripoli at the weekend. Could uh, the, the Syrian regime intentionally foment uh, violence, stir up trouble in, in Lebanon? What would be the, the benefit of doing so? I think it's the opposite is correct. The Syrians have no interest whatsoever to instigate any violence in Lebanon. Actually, some people were mad because the, the army, the Lebanese army, stood at the border and start stopping the sm smuggling of weapons from Tripoli into an uh, area into Syria. I think some people didn't like that. They starting to uh, shooting in Tripoli and they started that chaos in the, in the past two days. And not to mention because some people were mad because the Prime Minister Mekati made a successful visit to France. Some people didn't like that. But I think at this point, if anything, the Syrian wanted Lebanon to be calm because they think that Hamas seemed to be under control. But the Syrian wanted to stop the smuggling of weapons from Lebanon to Syria. And yesterday, the explosion of the de uh, deposit of uh, military uh, uh, bombs is an indication uh, at the level of smuggling of weapon from Tripoli into Syria. Mustafa Alush, on, on that note, what does uh, the weekend's violence in Tripoli uh, and uh, uh, the potential for further violence in northern Lebanon mean for those uh, supply routes, not just uh, the military ones, but also humanitarian ones uh, for humanitarian aid, medicines uh, and medical expertise? Well, we are already in a hardship. Uh, the population, that to start with, in uh, north Lebanon, uh, has a lot of economic and uh, 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 a lot of unemployment, uh, so we, we, we are in a real hardship. Uh, to add uh, on this, many people, ha uh, and they are not well to do, have to receive uh, a few uh, families, for, uh, refugees from Syria, and they are supporting them with whatever way they can. Now, if we add on all of this, uh, the security and stability, that means that the hardship will be, be double or triple or more. And uh, th this is why uh, it's not at, uh, for us, uh, for uh, uh, any interest for us to have any clashes in Tripoli. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, 
uh, the, what we really need in order to assist our uh, uh, brothers in Syria is to have as much as we can stability in Lebanon uh, in order to give them the best help. Well, Damascus has had uh, a long-standing influence on Lebanese politics. So when the Arab League took a stand against the Syrian government in November, Lebanon voted against suspending Syria's participation in the group's activities. It was also the only member state that did not endorse an Arab League plan urging Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to transfer powers to his deputy. Syria exerted its control over Lebanon between 1976 and 2005, up until the assassination of Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri. Damascus has since removed its military presence from Lebanon but still maintains that it had nothing to do with the plot. Meanwhile, some political groups enjoy support from the Syrian government. For its part, Hezbollah now controls the majority of Lebanon's parliament, and it's not too keen on seeing Assad fall from power. Elias Hanna, to what extent uh, could violence in Tripoli at the weekend spread throughout Lebanon? I think when we study the situation, everything in, is contextual in Lebanon. You have to study the the constituencies of each, you know, each place. Uh, my friend, uh, your guest said that uh, because of the arms smuggling, but Lebanon is accused for smuggling uh, for more than Tripoli and the northern of Lebanon from the Bekaa Valley. Why nothing happened in the Bekaa Valley? Because you know the constituencies of. Tripoli is something special. What constitutes uh, Tripoli, the social, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 mosaic over there, makes this thing explosive. You know, you have Sunni, and you have Alawi, and you have pro-resistance Hezbollah and pro-Syrian uh, uh, regime, and you have pro-14th of March and the future movement or the future party, and this expose one against and one with the regime in Syria. As you see, this mixture makes things explosive in, in Tripoli. If you go to other areas, I don't think that you have this mixture. So you have to study each area by itself. For instance, uh, in, in, in Beirut, during 7th of May 2008, uh, the, 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 the mini civil war that or mini sectarian war that occurred in Lebanon because you have this constituencies between the Shia and the Sunni after the assassination of Prime Minister Rafi al Hariri. So I don't think it will spread. However, maybe there is one reason in, in Tripoli. Why in Tripoli? Maybe because uh, we're having this uh, tit for tat between the cabinets and the Prime Minister. And because the Prime Minister is from Tripoli, maybe it is a lesson for. Uh, the prime minister in this particular time not taking some uh, real stance and or something major decision concerning the cabinet concerning what's going on in syria go, what's going on in the arab uh, league all of that so i don't think for the time being things will spread uh, outside tripoli uh, Kamal Wazni, the, the Prime Minister in, in Lebanon has adopted a, a policy of disassociation uh, on Syria. His office quoted him as saying uh, in Paris on Saturday that we need to take into consideration the internal divisions in Lebanon. We believe the preferable option is to keep uh, our distance from events uh, in Syria. Is that what he's done or, or are there signs of complicity with Damascus? I think no, the, the Prime Minister, he tr he's trying very hard to, to make that statement is very uh, implemented, but it's not happening on the ground. The, the political uh, spectrum in Lebanon, the, the, the office of the Prime Minister, the President of Lebanon, uh, indicated at the UN they wanted to distance themselves from the situation in Syria. But really, Lebanon does not go by the prime minister and does not go sometime by the president of the country. And we, we have seen alliance, some with the Syrian and some against the Syrian. But uh, I think on the ground, there is some people who are really uh, against the Syrian and all that militia that we have seen in Tripoli uh, with weapons, with, with guns, and they said they're ready to go into Syria and to help on the ground. That give another indication that the political, uh, the political uh, leadership saying something and people on the ground, at least in Tripoli, are doing something. Some people in Tripoli, they're trying to uh, take Lebanon to, into a very difficult 
position and that should be not be accepted because uh, at, at the end Syria is very vital country to Lebanon and I think this this thing Lebanon this thing Lebanon from the situation it's very hard to implement at this point. Uh, Mustafa Alushin, in, in Tripoli, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, assume for a moment that, that the Assad regime eventually falls uh, and that a Sunni-dominated government came to power in Damascus. Uh, do you think that would have the potential to spark uh, more trouble, and not just in Tripoli, but uh, uh, across Lebanon, even uh, a, a return to the dark days uh, of the civil war. How do you think uh, Hezbollah would, would react to that? Well, this is a really tricky question, and uh, it has uh, probably a Nobel Prize uh, man can answer this question. Uh, this depends on several uh, 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 givens. And uh, to start with, uh, I think that the Syrian regime itself has played a very negative role over the last 40 years uh, uh, with respect to the Lebanese security. And in fact, since their occupation to Lebanon in 1976, they played uh, with all parts and uh, uh, they created uh, fight, uh, fights between uh, factions and they were part of the Lebanese war for at least 14 or 15 years, and then they played uh, on differences between the sects at all times. So uh, this regime itself by, uh, uh, played a definite negative role with respect to security, uh, economics, uh, demography, or whatever uh, to Lebanon. We think that the fall of the Syrian regime, irrespective of what comes in, uh, to Syria, but we hope that democracy will reign uh, Syria, uh, will uh, give us a chance to have better relations with Syria, to have uh, equal and uh, cognitive uh, uh, relation with Syria. However, the problem is that Hezbollah has his own agenda with respect to Lebanon and with respect to Syria and probably to, with respect to all of the Arab world and Muslim world. And uh, in the case of the fall of the Syrian regime, their dream of having uh, to extend uh, the, the clergy rule or the Wilayat al-Faqih on uh, a big uh, uh, chunk of the Arab and Muslim world will be uh, definitely uh, well uh, under uh, jeopardy. This is why it depends on how will be the reaction of Hezbollah. Will it be more uh, logical and to come and uh, discuss with the rest of the Lebanese what they want to do with their illegal arms or they would uh, be more aggressive and try to uh, uh, take over the country. So uh, I'm not sure in the near future what will happen uh, with respect uh, after the fall of the Syrian regime. Let's get the thoughts then of uh, Elias Hanna uh, on, on the same question. Uh, how weakened would, uh, would Hezbollah... Can I, can I yes, elaborate on... Yes, by all means, can please I, do. Can I, uh, can I elaborate on something, please? Yes? By all means, carry on. OK. Uh, the problem in Lebanon, you're asking about the fall of the regime in Syria. So in Lebanon, I mean, if you want to think, you know, logically, you have to think about three possible scenarios in Syria. The first one, like the status quo of this one. Today's st uh, scenario is the status quo. So this one, if it goes longer than it is today, it will lead to the uh, worst case scenario. And then we have the best case scenario, which I see it, it's a little bit far today. Today in Lebanon, you have a part of Lebanon, because you asked if uh, the fall will influence the situation in Lebanon. Yes, for sure, because part of the Lebanese people are preparing for the best case scenario for them that the regime will last forever, and they are working accordingly. The other side of the Lebanese party, I mean the 14th of March, and you know, they are thinking about the worst case scenario. And like it is near and it's happening in the future. Nobody in Lebanon is uh, preparing in the middle what's, what are going to do in Lebanon. In the worst case, the best case, or the status quo. Should we do something and be, uh, have certain degree of immunity from what's going to happen from Syria? The uh, uh, ramification from the Syrian fall of the regime is going to be social, political, and economic. Because the economy is in Syria, not in Lebanon in general, because Syria is a capital provider. We are consuming. 
However, in the three possible scenarios, Hezbollah will be affected. Uh, affected in a way. And I think Hezbollah is a highly logical player. Then they are doing now, are reassessing the situation. And accordingly, they are planning for the three possible scenarios. What they have to do regionally with the Syrians, the coming of the Syrians, the new regime, you name it, and internally. And this is the way that the, the way I see it for the coming, you know, like uh, months. But the situation in Syria is not imminent. The fall of the regime is not imminent next month, this month, unless there is something catastrophic happens inside Syria. Come on, I want, I want to broaden this out just just for a moment. So far, we've been talking about uh, Sunni versus. Uh, Alawite, uh, Shia sect. Uh, of course, Lebanon uh, made up of, of, of so many uh, different um, uh, sects, religions. Uh, Christians, for instance, Patriarch uh, Bashar al-Rai of the Maronite Church warned back in September uh, that the Christian presence in the Middle East could be threatened if Assad falls and that he should be given the, the chance to reform. I mean, on that first point, do you agree? Is he right? I think that's uh, very much uh, uh, on the mark because a lot of people are worried about the emergency of Al-Qaeda and I, I assume that we have a lot of Al-Qaeda in, in the north of Lebanon and in, in Tripoli and we heard the Zawahiri what he said today and we have seen people coming uh, from the Arab country and being smuggled through Tripoli into Syria. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the situation, uh, uh, if escalate, uh, this is going to be devastating for Lebanon and for Syria and for the region. And I think if somebody thinks the regime of Bashar al-Assad can collapse that easily, I think we will have regional war before that will happen. At this point, if uh, we have to be logical, we have to call for reconciliation and support the, uh, the, the dialogue that should start in Syria. The bloodshed will never solve the crisis. The, the smuggling of weapons, the shooting at people will not solve and help okay. the situation right. either in Lebanon or in Syria. Okay. The message is reconciliation, right. uh, help the Syrian to get together and achieve a peaceful uh, resolution. Okay, Elias, Hannah, you're shaking your head. Yes, I mean, I mean, usually when we talk about Al Qaeda, what Qaeda are we talking about? You know, we have different Al Qaeda after 9/11. We have Al Qaeda, centralized Al Qaeda, and prior to 9/11, when we had you know Al Khubar, when we had USS Cole. After 9/11, we don't really have Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda became regionalized, you know, regionalized as a region in Al Iraq, Abu Musab Al Zarqawi, uh, Al Aulaki in Al Yemen, in uh, uh, Morocco, Al Maghrib, Al Arabic Al Maghrib. Now, when we talk about Al Qaeda, it's not Al Qaeda that we used to be. I think I am from the north. I am from Akkar, you know, like near Tripoli. And I know that when you want to have Al-Qaeda, you need a safe haven for Al-Qaeda. And I don't think that the Sunnis in Lebanon are really supportive of Al-Qaeda. Maybe there is some exception of it, you know. Let's take, for example, uh, the, the, the future movement. It's like liberal believing in, you know, in democracy and everything. It's not, it doesn't fit with Al-Qaeda. So when we talk about Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda is something different. If you go to Fort Hood in, in, in Texas, in, in the United States of America, the major that, he, you know, uh, out, he came out of nothing and killed like 17 people of his, you know, uh, 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 peers within the uh, uh, military base. So Al Qaeda is totally different today. However, uh, at the Lebanese scene, yeah. we have to be ready for all the possible scenarios. Okay. You know, the Alawi are Lebanese, yep. are Le Lebanese citizens, so we have to take care about them. Okay. Gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. I know that Kamal wanted to come back, but uh, we, are, we have to finish the program. Thank you to all my guests in Beirut, Kamal Wazni, also in Beirut to Elias Hanna, and in Tripoli, Mustafa Alouche. And thank you very much indeed for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, please email us your thoughts at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. From me, Adrian Finnegan in Doha, I'll see you again. Bye for now.